Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for this morning is our Gospel lesson for this 15th Sunday after Pentecost from the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 16th chapter, the parable of the dishonest manager. Dear brothers and sisters in the Lord Christ Jesus, today's parable has a reputation for being rather difficult. In particular, the question arises, does Jesus actually want us to emulate a dishonest manager? I have to admit, though, I don't find it that tricky. There are a lot of other New Testament passages that are much more difficult. In fact, if you would like to know what the most difficult passage in all the New Testament is, I'll tell you in Bible class this morning. And I have an idea of what it means. I'm probably wrong. This one doesn't rank up there with the very most difficult passages because Jesus' meaning is clear enough. Jesus doesn't want us to emulate the dishonesty of the manager, but his shrewdness. Jesus would have us be as shrewd in heavenly matters as this dishonest manager is shrewd in earthly matters. So if we can figure out just how this manager is shrewd and apply that earthly shrewdness to heavenly shrewdness, we'll be getting at what Jesus wants us to take from this otherwise rather tricky parable. And as we consider the parable, we find that the shrewdness of the dishonest manager can be boiled down to three things. One, he recognizes that the wealth he has is not his own. It belongs to his master. Two, he recognizes that, that, that the wealth he has is not going to last forever. It is soon going to be taken away from him. So he'd better use it wisely now. And third, he realizes that the wealth he has now can be used now in such a way that it benefits him in the future. So if we can take all of those points and apply them spiritually, we Christians need to recognize that everything we have belongs to God. That everything we have is going to be taken away and that everything we have can be used now in such a way that it benefits us everlastingly. Let's see how this works. First of all, the dishonest manager is shrewd in recognizing that what he has is not really his. He seems to treat it as his own at first. He's wasting his master's possessions. And we can imagine the kinds of things that he's wasting them on. Raucous parties, he's probably stuffing himself with the finest of foods. He's probably dressing extravagantly. He's doing everything he can to take advantage of his master's property for his own transient benefit. So the master hears about it and says, you can no longer be manager. Well, he realizes what he has, what he's been spending on himself, is not his own to spend. He was supposed to be spending it to benefit his master's property. He was supposed to be investing it wisely. He was supposed to be engaging in wise business transactions so that he could prosper his master's estate. But he remembers now that what he has is not his own. It belongs to his master. And so if he uses it to benefit someone other than himself, he has nothing to lose. He can be as generous as he wishes with his master's possessions and it won't hurt him at all. all right, so that's part one of his shrewdness. He recognizes that what he has does not belong to him. It belongs to his master. But then, of course, since his master has caught him out in his wasting of the master's possessions, the master says you can no longer be manager. He's going to be fired at a set time in the future. The wealth he has now, which he recognizes at last is not belonging to him, is belonging to his master, that wealth that he has now is only going to be his to use for so long. Eventually, pretty soon, 
it's all going to be taken away. Which again emphasizes that he can be as generous as he wishes with it and it won't hurt him at all. He's got nothing to lose. It's going to be taken away anyway. He may as well use it while he has it. And finally, how does he use it in the short time allotted to him? He uses it now while he still has it in such a way that it will benefit him in the future. Now he could have approached this by saying, oh look, I've only got two more weeks to be manager. That's two more weeks to live it up. I'm going to waste everything I can on my own fleshly desires. I'm going to uh, make hay while I can and then I'll be destitute, but for now I'm going to seize the day and suck the marrow out of it. That's not what he does. He recognizes that he's something he can, there is something he can do with his master's wealth now that will benefit him in the future. If he just wastes it all on himself, he is going to be forced into manual labor digging or the shame of begging. How can he avoid that? He's got to find some way to use his master's possessions now so that he can have a better life when he's fired. And he figures out what he can do. He can swindle his master, so to speak. He can bring in his master's clients and give them deep discounts. See, his master is a patron. And as a patron, he has many clients. The master has more money than he needs. He has abundant wealth. He's got capital to spare. But he's surrounded by neighbors who need his money in order to, to undertake their projects. They need money to buy extra, uh, extra grain to get a, a significant harvest. They buy their supplies from the master, but now they're having trouble paying it back. And that doesn't help anybody. It doesn't help them because they remain ever more deeply in debt. It doesn't help the master because he's not recouping the loss. But the manager figures out something he can do. He calls in his master's clients and he gives them discounts that his master is not authorized. But he has authority over his master's possessions for the time being. They're not really his and they're going to run out anyway, so he may as well use them generously toward his master's clients. And sure enough, he takes one person's bill and cuts it by 50%. Another person's bill cuts it by 20%. He gives these deep discounts and he wins friends for himself among his master's clients. Finally, he's fired. We don't have record of the firing, but we can imagine it takes place. He's fired. And instead of having to go dig ditches, Instead of having to beg on the street corner, he goes to his master's clients. And he says, hey, remember me? He says, oh yes, I owe you one. I would have lost my farm if not for you. Say, I heard that you've fallen on hard times. You've been fired. I'm so sad to hear that. Come on in. Well, you can stay with me for a while. And he crashes with his master's clients. I don't know if they have couches to crash on or what, but they're, they're generous toward him. They show him hospitality. They make sure he doesn't have to dig or to beg. He can live off of their generosity for a long time to come because he has used his master's wealth to make friends with his master's clients. All right, that's how he is shrewd. He's shrewd by recognizing that what he has is not his own, it's his master's. What he has is not going to last forever, it's going to be taken away, and what he has can be used now to benefit him in the future. How do we apply that spiritually? Well, you have a bunch of stuff. You have your money, of course. You have what Jesus called unrighteous mammon. Some of us have more of it than others, but we all have it to one degree or another. But that's not all you have. You have your body and soul, your eyes, ears, and all your members, your reason and all your senses. You have your clothing and shoes, food and drink, house and home, your spouse, your children, your family, your friends. You have all of these good things that have been given to you. Whose are they? We naturally view them as ours. We view ourselves as having complete authority over everything that belongs to us. Certainly, I own my own body, don't I? I can call the shots when it comes to the use of my own body, my own money, my own home. But shrewdness 
means recognizing that everything we have does not belong to us. It belongs to the master who gave it. It is something entrusted to us. And our master intends that we should use it wisely. Yes, it's your money. He's given it to you to use as you see fit. But he's given you certain guidelines as to how he wishes you to use it. Yes, your body is your own, but it comes to you from him. And he gets to tell you how to use it. And if you use it wrongly for the defiling passions to satisfy the lusts of your flesh, well, that's not what the Master intends. And he's not going to be happy with how you treated his possessions that he placed for a while in your keeping. In fact, point one leads to point two. Point one is everything we have doesn't belong to us, it belongs to God. But then point two is everything we have is going to be taken away from us. And when is it all going to be taken away from us? When we die. What's the phrase? You can't take it with you. You can't take it with you. You can't take your money with you. You can't take unrighteous mammon with you. You can't take your family with you. You can't take your house with you. You can't take your body with you. It's all going to be taken away at the moment of your death. Why is it all going to be taken away? Because we are sinners. We are under the judgment of Almighty God. And He has set forth death as the punishment for our sin. And what is sin but misusing the good things that God has given us? You look at the first sin in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve were given all these fruits to do with as they please, and there was one fruit to which God attached a law, and they used it not according to God's law, but according to their own desires. And the penalty was death, and that death has come to us all. We are all of us going to be bereft of all of our possessions one day. Wisdom means recognizing that. Spiritual wisdom means recognizing that everything you have belongs to God and that everything you have is going to be taken away. It's not going to last forever. But if we stop there, all we've got is nihilism. We may as well live it up now because we won't have opportunity later. If you do that, you'll be truly poor in the life to come. But there is something you can do now with your stuff that will impact you in the eternal future. And shrewdness means recognizing how to use your good things now for the eternal future. What does Jesus say? He says, use unrighteous mammon, use your wealth to make friends for yourselves so that they can receive you into the eternal mansions. The way Jesus is explaining it here is we've got the poor who believe in Him, who trust in Jesus. They trust in the Lord God of Israel. And when they die, they're going to be received into the eternal mansions. Next week, we're going to be hearing about Lazarus and the rich man. Lazarus, the poor beggar, sits at the rich man's gate. He's impoverished. And when he dies with nothing, he's taken to the feast to the bosom of Abraham where he is comforted and has every good thing. The poor in this life will be made rich in the life to come when they receive all that they had trusted God to give them. Well, you can make friends with them. How? By using your wealth, by using your stuff, by using everything that God has given you in order to benefit them, to serve your neighbor. And then, when it comes time for you to forfeit everything and go on to the life to come, you'll find them waiting for you. Those saints whom you had blessed through the wise use of your earthly gifts, they will receive you into the eternal mansions. Now, it's easy, of course, to come to a misunderstanding about this. It is not as if the poor are going to have a role in your judgment and say, you know, God, maybe you should let him in because he was good to me. That would be pretty much works righteousness. You give enough money to this or that cause, you go to heaven. That's not how it works. Rather, on the last day at the final judgment, these poor whom you served through faith in the Son of God will be able to testify before the throne of God, yes, this person helped me. This person served me 
in love. And that shows the genuineness of his faith. If you have faith in the Son of God, if you trust in Jesus as your sacrifice for sin, whose blood shed on the cross has cleansed you of all iniquity, who has brought you a place in His kingdom, if you trust in Him, then that trust, that faith, which alone brings you to heaven, will bring forth good works of love, love for God above all things, and love for the neighbor as yourself. And on the last day, those neighbors whom you served and loved will be able to testify before God to your service toward them, how you use what you have now to have an impact on the eternal future. And they will show that your works of love gave evidence of the genuineness of your faith. Early November, I'm going to get to give a, a paper on the role of works in the final judgment it's going to be at a lay theological conference at Trinity Lutheran Church. I'd encourage you, we'll start publicizing it soon. I'd encourage you to come. I also get to hear Pastor Hoft at uh, Parkview and Pastor Furch at Emmanuel. But I'm really excited getting to explain to a bunch of Lutheran laity that we're all going to be judged based on works on the last day. What that means is the works that are shown on the last day will be judged as evidence of your faith. And it is that faith alone which makes you righteous in God's sight. So, you have your stuff. You have your body and soul, your, your possessions, your house and home, all of your money, all of your wealth. You have all of that. What are you going to do with it? Jesus says, be shrewd with it. Be wise with it. Recognize, first of all, that it's not yours to begin with. It's God's who gave it. Recognize, second of all, that it's not going to last forever. It's going to be taken away. And recognize, finally, that you should use it now in such a way that it will benefit you everlastingly. Use it now to give evidence of your faith. Use it now to show your love for God and for your neighbor. Use it now to make friends for yourself in the life to come. And on the last day, that will prove the genuineness of your faith, the faith in the Son of God who died for you and rose for you and prepared a place for you in His kingdom. We won't have to dig, we won't have to beg, but we will be received into the heavenly mansions which Jesus has prepared for those who trust in Him. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.